If you'll please take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. We're continuing our study in this book of Ephesians and we're in the application part where we have looked at the doctrine of what it is we're to believe and why and now we're into the practical application of how to apply. So for me, it, it seemed this week a lot of this is kind of like analogous to the military where you go through boot camp and they begin to tear you down as an individual and try to create you back up in the midst of the military understanding of what it means to be a part of one another. You're given new uniforms to kind of set you apart. That you also go through training for your jobs, but then you also have a code of conduct that progresses throughout your career. The same is very true in regards to the Christian faith. Those of us who have come to faith in Christ, we are being transformed. And as we're being transformed, we saw last week that the Apostle Paul told us to put off some things, but to put on others. And now today we find ourselves in the midst of this code of conduct, this training, and it really is a central metaphor for these 21 verses that we'll look at this morning of how to walk in our Christian faith. So we're told to walk in love, we're told to walk in light, and we're told to walk in wisdom. And so we're going to unpack that this morning, but let us first go to the Lord and ask him to lead. Heavenly Father, you are the word. You are the living incarnate, the thing that we are to look to for our understanding of who you are, but also what you've called us to be in Christ. And so, Father, do open our eyes to see this passage this morning. May we truly grasp and understand what it means to walk in love as your children, what it means to walk in the light and not in the darkness, and what it means to be wise in your love and your understanding and not a fool. So, Father, you teach, you change. For this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to see that we're told to walk in love. This is verses 1 through 7. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. So let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude jo joking, which is out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So that no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become part partners with them. So here we have verses 1 through 5, and he tells us what does it mean to walk in love. Now, I want to kind of look at this by looking at what love is not. And so what happens is the world begins to look for lust. And lust is where we try to please ourselves at the cost of others, whereas love is pleasing others at the cost of ourselves. And so we have this understanding where there are counterfeits. It's talking about impurity. It's talking about covetousness. It's talking about foolish talk. So we begin to see this being unpacked. And so what happens is the world tries to find love in all the wrong places. They seek after momentary pleasures. And this could be whether it could be outward sins, those that we see, but it's also, as Jesus told us, there can be inward sins, sins of the mind where we find ourselves in a, a place where our lives begin to spiral out of control. And what happens when things start to spiral out of control in our lives, we start to live with guilt and shame. We begin to have obsessions and maybe even addictions. And so we find this lust in the counterfeit of impurity striving to gain influence into our lives. But not only is there an impurity that we have to deal with, but there's also covetedness, a dissatisfaction or a desire for more. We always want more from other people. We always want more from the world. And it means that we usually have a contentment or a trust issue. We don't believe that what God has given to us is enough. We don't believe that God will take care of us. The songs that we're singing, those are words easy to say, hard to put into practice. 
Because a lot of us, if we're honest, we don't trust God. We want to be our own saviors. We want to make sure we've taken care of ourselves. And then we ask God to bless. We should be asking God to bless and then allow us to be content with where he brings us. I think most of us would have struggled, as Elijah did, going into the woman's home and asking for bread and seeing that it's down to the last jar of oil. Will God really take care of us? Is he really who he says he is? And to have him fill daily for our needs. So we have this discontentment, so we have a covetousness, we have an impurity, but we also have foolish talk. Now this foolish talk, if you look up Ecclesiastes 7, 6, this is what it says. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools, this also is vanity. Now many of you know that if you were to put together a, a, a fire, if you're out in the woods and you're trying to, to make a dinner or something like that, what you don't look for is fuel of thorns and little uh, bushes or leaves. Why? Because they make a great sound. They pop. They sound like they're burning and they're in this kind of inferno. But it's momentary. It can't last. It can't feed the food that we're cooking. So it is with foolish talk. It's when we begin to rob individuals of their dignity through innuendos, lewd or suggestive comments. One commentator put it this way. It's dirty minds who live in dirty talk. So that's what happens with foolish talk. So we're supposed to get away out of these counterfeits. We're supposed to do away with impurity. We're supposed to do away with covetedness and supposed to do away with the foolish talk. But the Apostle Paul also gives to us a warning. And the warning he gives to us is this. First is that there will be the wrath of God. Now, if you look in your Bibles, this is written in a present tense, which means that God is against those Meaning that our sin will find us out. Now again, it might not become public, but our sins will be exposed. And how quickly we are to dismiss our sins. So again, we're, we're okay with talking about sins generally. Are you a sinner? Yes. Now, name me your sin. Whoa. You're getting too personal now. But what God asks us to do is to look at our hearts and say, name the sins that are there because we should not become desensitized. We should not become desensitized to the warning. We should not become desensitized to our sin. And a lot of times we get to the place where we say things like, well, no one gets hurt. That's a lie. People are hurt all the time by sins. Most importantly, God. Remember when the prodigal son comes back, he says what? What is the, the thing that he says that's the most wise thing? Against you, Father. Not his dad, but against God the Father, have I sinned. See, it's the most costly thing that we have, but it's not just present tense, and that's true that our sins will find us out, but it's also future judgment. He says the wrath of God will judge those who are doing these things. Now, wait a minute, Pastor. Doesn't everyone sin? Yes. So what's the difference? For if you are a Christian, if you're sinning, then you find yourself of one trying to not make it a habit. You find yourself hating sin. You find yourself repenting of sin and crying out to God. If you are living in sin and you have none of that, you have no guilt or shame connected to you, if you find yourself being able to uh, justify it and go back to it, you know what it's become? It's become idolatry. You have replaced the living God with something that's false. And he's saying that is what happens with the world. They go about impurities. They go about covetousness. They go about foolish talk. And they will not inherit the kingdom. So the Apostle Paul then turns it around. And what he tells us in, chat, in verses 1 and 2 is he reminds us about what it means to be loved by God. And again, this isn't just like, it's not just brotherly love. This is the agape love. It's the unconditional love. And it's a love where we are called children of God. 
So those of us who are in Christ, we are his children, which means we're wrapped in eternal, perfect, and sacrificial love. And it's a costly sacrifice. Herman Ritterboss, a professor, had this very famous statement. He says, the imperative rests on the indicative. Now, what does that mean? It means that we obey the Lord because we are loved. Not to earn his love, but because we are so loved by God, we are to obey. We are to, in essence, as Apostle Paul told us, we are to imitate our God as his children. Now, we understand that children imitate something or someone all the time, right? Put them in front of a TV. What do they start acting like? They start acting like the characters on TV. You start saying words that you don't want repeated. What are the words those children say? They imitate the things that they see and hear. So the question is, what are they imitating and who? And the scripture is clear that we are having to look to the perfect model, and that's Jesus. And it says very clearly that he is an offering and a sacrifice. And those are two distinct things. An offering is where we give of ourself. So that's an offering. But then if we're called to be a sacrifice, that's where we die for another person. And so the Apostle Paul is saying, we have this perfect example of Jesus Christ on the cross who gave himself as an offering and as a sacrifice. And so we are so supposed to be imitating Christ to others. We're supposed to be a fragrant offering to one another. Not, as we learned last week, rotting fruit. We are to be someone who sacrifices for one another, submitting to one another, not living as the world does, trying to take from other people. And so as we're giving this model and we're trying to live it out, he also tells us to look to thanksgiving, respond with thanksgiving. So instead of being foolish talk, we need to, to take that and rob it and starve it. But we need to feed thanksgiving. Everything can be a reason for Thanksgiving. There was a story as I was reading this of a, a person whose uh, grandson left and moved to another state. And so a friend went to visit. And so this grandchild goes into his pocket. He reaches into his pocket and he pulls out a big wad of lint. And he says, please give this to grandma and tell her I miss her and love her. And so the neighbor took the lint and as soon as they had the opportunity, they threw it away in the garbage can. And they went back to the grandmother and told the story. And the grandmother said, I wish I had the lint. Because that was all he had to give. And I would have loved to have had it. Are we giving thanks for everything? Whatever we have, are we giving thanks to the Lord. And the warning for non Christians becomes for Christians security. Why? When the Apostle Paul says, Those uh, who will not inherit are the ones who still do these things. For those who are in Christ, you are a part of the family. And if you're adopted into the family, and again, we have another great example with the Roberts family. So, as they have three adopted children now. One of the great things in our law and the law back then, if you were adopted, listen, by law, you can never be written out of the family. You can't be written out of the, wall, the will. Your natural children, you're out. You don't please me, you get nothing. An adopted child, forever secure. So it's not by chance or accident that God calls us his adopted children. We are secure in our family relationship. And it comes with unconditional love for us. So we're supposed to walk in love. The second thing he tells us in verses 8 through 14 is to walk in light. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. 
and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So we're supposed to not walk in darkness. And again, he gives a very specific wording. He doesn't say, hey, you were in darkness. He says, you were darkness. So we were part of the problem. We were in partnership with sin. And when we're in partnership with sin, we bring about unfruitful works. Listen, God has given to us in the scripture a perfect pattern. And what does the world do? It's always trying to mar that pattern. Even back in the beginning where it says that it's man, woman, and creation. How does the world say? Creation, woman, then the man. So there are more rights for animals than there are for unborn children. The world is always trying to mar the pattern that God gives us. And when we find ourselves in the midst of those works, we never accomplish anything good. And it never, ever satisfies. Not fully. See, we can be so concerned about others. We can be so concerned about the self. Listen, there was a true story of someone, a couple who stopped a robbery. And so the people wanted to come and put them on the news. And the man said this, please don't put us on the news because the woman I'm with is not my wife. See, we're, we find ourselves, there's a reason why they're called black ops. There's a reason why people find themselves in covert operations. When people start talking to you and say, hey, can I talk to you in private? Your radar should go up. Why can you not speak about this in front of others? Because what God's telling us is that in the midst of our sinfulness, we find very hidden selves. We hide our sins. We're good at it. And it says that even the very hearts of ourselves are evil. So he says, if we were darkness, then when we come to Christ, we find ourselves as light. We are light. Which means that we begin to reflect God. Listen to this. There were uh, three main festivals that the men were supposed to go to Jerusalem for. And the last one of the year was called the Feast of Booths, or Tabernacles as, as it's known, or Succoth. It's got many names in the Jewish faith, okay? But the Feast of Booths would actually happen, and what would happen is that they would bring these huge candelabras into the temple. And what the priests would do is they would fill it with oil, and then they would light it, and it would light up the surrounding area. And then all the men with their torches would sing and dance, and they would light up the countryside. And it was to reenact the people coming out of Egypt into the promised land, where God led them by the cloud and the pillar of light. Now, I want you to understand the next day in John 8, 12, this is what Jesus says. Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, Jesus is saying something very specific here about being the son of God, but he's also saying something very specific about light. Listen, the moon has no light in and of itself. It reflects what? The sun. We have no light in and of ourselves. We reflect who as Christians? God. And so as God begins to live within us, we are to reflect his goodness to those around us. And when we do that, what we have is fruitful works. Our works begin to make a difference. Now, what I'm not saying is to avoid non-Christians. We are supposed to be around non-Christians. We're just not supposed to join in their sin. We're supposed to be that light that shines where we're saying, are we giving glory to God? Are we living in such a way? Are we asking the questions that it says in Scripture? Is this good? Is this right? Is this true? And if we can't answer those things positively, then we probably shouldn't be doing them. 
But we should have our fruits exposed because when we are living in such a way, it begins to expose the darkness around us. True life example about Billy Graham. Uh, This was written um, in the the stuff by R.C. Sproul. A well-known professional golfer was playing in a tournament with President Gerald Ford, fellow pro Jack Nicklaus, and Billy Graham. After the round was over, one of the other pros on the tour asked, hey, what was it like playing with the president and Billy Graham? The pro said with disgust, I don't need Billy Graham stuffing religion down my throat. With that, he headed for the practice tee and his friend followed. And after the golfer had pounded out his fury on a bucket of golf balls, he's asked, was Billy a little rough on you out there? And then the pro sighed and said with embarrassment, no, he didn't even mention religion. Astonishing, Billy Graham had said nothing about God, Jesus, or religion, yet the pros stomped away after the game, accusing Billy of trying to ram religion down his throat. So what had happened? Simply this, the evangelist had so reflected Christ's likeness that his presence brought the same feeling to the pro as experienced by Isaiah. He knew he was lost, a man of unclean lips, living among a people of unclean lips. In the life of Billy Graham, the lost pro had sensed the presence of our holy God. Are we so living our lives that people in their sin are being exposed without us even to have to say a word? See, we are to live in such a way that we expose the sins in our own lives as well as those around us. Now please understand this point though. You are no one's savior. But you can point them to the one who is. So expose sin, walk in light, walk in love. And then the third thing he tells us is to walk in wisdom. Verses 15 through 21. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So he talks about fools. And fools in Scripture have a very specific um, definition. It comes from Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds, and there is none who does good. That's the definition of a fool. And the fools go around and they try to corrupt and they're imprudent. And with fools, what they do is they begin to waste time. See, history and time mean nothing to a fool. Why? Because their mantra is this. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. That's the mantra of our world. Hey, be about you. Yes. Be number one. The one who has the most toys wins. You know who you need to talk to to find that that's false? Anybody who has the toys. They want more, they want more, and it never satisfies. But yet they continue to seek and they waste time. Why? Because they're controlled. They're controlled by the self. They're controlled for the immediate. They're controlled for whatever makes me feel happy. So they don't care. Only them. And when that that happens, then what we need to find ourselves is reminding ourselves what it means to be wise in Christ. And those who are wise are filled with Christ. And so wisdom becomes very urgent, especially in this world. Why? Because time is short. And what he tells us in the passage is we as Christians are to redeem time. We're supposed to seize the moment, which means that every moment is eschatological. 
Which means we should be thinking of saying, am I wasting my time by doing this? And we've all said that, right? If we've seen the movie, that's horrible. I just wasted two hours of my life. So ask yourself, what is God calling you to do so that you're not wasting your life? And more times, nine times out of ten probably, it's not sitting down and watching TV. Maybe it's not always about you. Maybe it's you going through and saying, who am I praying for? Who am I inviting to my house? Who am I inviting myself to their house? I don't care if you do that. One of the things about what the young people said is we don't have our own homes. So would some of the people who are older invite us to their house? And I'm not asking to invite all 30, 40 plus young professionals to your home. Invite two or three. But make the effort. Redeem the time. I've told you this before. One of the things that I learned in youth ministry. If you can do something with someone, then don't do it alone. Teach them. Spend time. So we have this opportunity to, to think about time to figure out the will of God, both the general will and his particular will for us. How? By being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now again, this isn't a special, if, if you come from a Pentecostal background like myself, this is not a special blessing. It's not the second blessing where you're filled to speak in tongues. That's not what this is talking about. When you talk about being filled with the Spirit, it's the one-time occurrence where the Spirit fills us, but then He constantly empowers us over and over and over again. That's why we are told to walk. And so we have unceasing experience of the Holy Spirit inhabiting our lives. And if He's inhabiting our lives, He's always pushing us back to Christ. And as He's in, in pushing us back to Christ, He also empowers us to live as followers of Christ. And so we're supposed to give thanks for everything always in the name of Christ, even when things are bad. And again, so I mean, here's, I'm looking at a, a woman I love, and we've been praying for, for Bob for his uh, migraines. He was given shots in both sides of his, uh, was it the neck or head? The head. Shots in his head for migraines, and he's still having migraines. And she's just like, God, come on. We get it, Right? We all need to be praying for Bob. God, please take away the migraines. And if not, then let us be better about loving on them. See, we're called to be a part of allowing the Spirit to fill us. But then he starts this, and again, this is where we're going to start getting some people upset and stuff like that, but he's going to talk about submission. And the first thing he does is he sets this apart before he gets into the specifics. And he says, submit one to another. And so we are supposed to submit to one another. We're supposed to be ministering God's word to each other. We're supposed to be loving each other. We're supposed to be doing ministry to one another. And again, it doesn't have to be spectacular. It doesn't have to be the times where we bring people up here and go, oh, let's celebrate what they've done. Because this is an incredible thing. If you are here and you come every week and you talk to someone new or you go to the people and you ask, hey, what's going on? How can I pray for you? Then you are doing ministry. You're submitting one to another. You know, the people who scare me is the people who find themselves only around themselves. Why is that? Because they're always right. The moment that you think that you don't need other Christians, then you've missed the perfection and the love of the gospel message. Christ gave everything for us. Everything. And he asks us to do the same for one another. So there's our charge. That's what points us to the table this morning. Not are we forgiven of our sins, but do we love the way that Christ loves us? So let's pray as we prepare ourselves to come to the table this morning. Heavenly Father, please take what we have just talked about and that you have allowed the Holy Spirit to minister to us. 
And Father, may it make deep roots into our hearts, Lord, that we wouldn't just simply pass this by, but Lord, that we would be convicted of what it means to not lust after the things that the world has to give, but that we would find our significance and security in Christ and Him alone. Lord, that we would not walk in darkness, but Lord, that even in the midst of our sins that we don't want to name, that we would expose them, that we would bring them to you and know that you forgive them and you throw them as far as the east is from the west and you remember them no more. And Father, allow us to live as those who are wise and not as fools. Lord, that we would know that there is a God and that we've been called to redeem the time, to live a life that brings glory and honor to you. And so, Father, make it very real as we taste and see the gospel message in a very real way in your supper this morning. Minister to us, this we pray in Christ's name. Amen.